Hello, and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Hit the like button if you like the video, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from me, and you can always join my Patreon. We have a big goal there, and I will talk about that at the end of the video. Well, my friends, this will be the last ever cult story I do here on Dining with Death. But when the channel rebrands on January 1st to Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee, I will have an entire playlist of cults. There are so, so many of these groups out there, each as dark and strange as the next, but some are more dangerous and deadly than others. Today we are talking about a cult that looks absolutely beautiful on the outside. A little group of hippies making what are apparently some of the most delicious sandwiches on earth. But if you look past the shiny happy people front, like with most cults, something very dark and sinister lies just under the surface. This is the story of the Yellow Deli and the cult that runs it, the 12 tribes. I'm your host, Stacey Lee. Let's get into it. Our story begins in Chattanooga, Tennessee. A man named Gene Spriggs and his wife Marcia run a small coffee shop out of their home and that coffee shop becomes a gathering spot for the like-minded people of the day. Now, this is the heart of the hippie era. It was very common for people to sit around for hours and days discussing religion and philosophy and the universe and energy. And in order to have those discussions, people need to have a meeting place. All over America at that time were little restaurants, vegetarian cafes, coffee shops, where you could, at any time, stumble upon a serious discussion being had by people who spent their days taking psychedelic drugs and expanding their minds with very deep discussions. Jean and Martha's little coffee shop in Chattanooga was one of those places, and soon it was well known throughout the area that all were welcome to come and join in the discussions and partake of other things as well. Also in Chattanooga was a small group that practiced communal living and had some very extreme beliefs about Christianity, and they called themselves the Light Brigade. The group was affiliated with the First Presbyterian Church, but were then ousted for allowing members of different races and economic status into that group. That was something at the time, maybe still, was unacceptable in the First Presbyterian Church. So the members of the Light Brigade were seen as outcasts, but still members of the church. Soon the Light Brigade began to gather more members, and it kind of assimilated people who were hanging out at Jean and Marcia's coffee shop. The Light Brigade grew and gained some members that had a little money, and the group took that money and opened a restaurant with it. They called the restaurant the Yellow Deli, and it was almost instantly a huge success. We'll talk more about the restaurant in a moment. Then on January 12th, 1975, the Light Brigade members arrived at the local First Presbyterian Church only to find that the services had been canceled due to the Super Bowl that day. And this made these very extreme fundamentalists angry. They were appalled that services would be canceled for something like a football game. The group held a meeting and decided it was time to sever all ties with the First Presbyterian Church. And they formed a church they called the Vine Christian Community Church. You know, when you are a church in the South that is not extreme enough for some people, um, <laughs> these people were extreme, to put it mildly. Now, the Vine, the church they formed, was sustained with money made at the Yellow Deli. For the next several years, members of the Vine worked to open more franchises of the Yellow Deli. Locations were opened in Dalton and Trenton, both in Georgia, in Mentone, which is in Alabama, and another in Dayton, Tennessee. At each of these Yellow Delis, the Vine planted members to run the restaurants, but running the restaurant wasn't their real job. Recruiting more members for the church was. When the group broke ties with the First Presbyterian Church, it caused quite a stir because the members of the Vine were openly making very harsh accusations against First Presbyterian and its members. Very soon, there were sermons coming out of the First Presbyterian Church to stay away from members of the Vine, to avoid their restaurants, and to warn others about them as well. 
There was a lot of tension between the two groups, and it only got worse when the Vine began holding its own public services in Warner Park in Chattanooga. They called these services critical mass. Everyone was welcome to attend. The Vine appointed elders, and then they began baptizing people in the park pond. Now, this made surrounding churches very angry because the Vine had no authority. <laughs> We all know that churches are all about control and power and authority, and they claim that they've been given that authority by God. They all claim that. Well, the Vine members were this little offshoot of hippies. Who did they think they were to be claiming they had the authority to baptize people? <laughs> it just cracks me up because all of these churches are made up by men, and all of the rules are made up by men, and then they get in these little battles, you know, we have the authority, but you don't. Well, who gave you authority? God did. Well, who gave you the authority? God did. <laughs> Just let people do what they wanna do. As long as they're not hurting anybody else, who cares? But cults do hurt people. So what happens next? Well, you know, whenever a group dares to step out of line and tell the powers that be that they're not going to follow their rules anymore, the do-gooders and the flag wavers step in and try and shove them back into line. This little religious war attracted the attention of the Parents Committee to Free Our Children from the Children of God. Wow, who came up with that catchy name? And another organization called Citizens Freedom Foundation. Have you ever noticed that the organizations with the name freedom in them are promoting like the least amount of freedom possible? <laughs> or a brand of freedom that falls very carefully into certain definitions and boxes, which is the antithesis of freedom. <laughs> these people, I swear. Anyway, these two freedom groups began preaching against the vine and they began calling them a cult, which is rich coming from any religious group. Jean and Marcia Spriggs were still leading the group, this group that started in their house years back. And the do-gooders decided that Jean was making blasphemous claims about his power and they labeled him a cult leader. Then the two freedom coalitions hired a man named Ted Patrick, who was a very famous deprogrammer for cults. Deprogramming and cults was really big back in the 70s. There's some good documentaries. We're gonna be talking about documentaries on dark hearts, but there's some really good deprogramming documentaries. And Ted Patrick, he was very famous at the time. So these little freedom coalitions hired Ted Patrick to try and break up these cults. Now, I am not pro the vine here. They're incredibly problematic and we're going to get into their wacky beliefs here in a minute. But I just think it's funny that people in mainstream churches get all up in arms about people who won't fall in line and decide to start their own church as if their church wasn't started the exact same way how many ever years ago, you know? I mean, it happened to Joseph Smith back in the Midwest. He didn't want to join any of the churches. He wanted to start his own and they ran him out of there. They killed him and then, you know, the Mormons ended up moving to Utah where they could live in isolation. It's just the same story over and over and over. But these mainstream churches and the Freedom Coalitions, along with this really famous deprogrammer, succeeded in running the group out of town. People call Ted Patrick the father of deprogramming, and he wasn't above doing what it took to get people away from cults. And he did do some really good work. If my kids joined a cult, I would probably hire somebody to try to get them out. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, I would. Like I said, I'm not pro the vine here. But Ted ends up getting charged with kidnapping several times for taking people away from cults in order to try and deprogram them. He's still alive. He is 93 years old right now, and I think he still lectures about cult awareness. So this was the type of person the Vine was up against, really, really powerful people. Ted Patrick gets hired by a Chattanooga police officer whose daughter had joined the Vine. And Ted and the cop get basically a fake warrant signed by a judge to get this girl out of the cult. This is the kind of power that Ted Patrick had. And the Vine ended up closing all of the Yellow Deli locations except the one in Dalton. And then they ended up closing that one as well. They pretty much got shut down. And there was some good reason for that. People did feel like they were kidnapping their kids and taking them into this weird little group. And that's scary. Mainstream religion is also scary. It's just more acceptable. So with all of the delis closed, the cult up and moved away from the friction and the fighting, and they relocated to Vermont. And that's when things get much, much worse. 1981. 
The Vine has now lost its source of income, the Yellow Deli restaurants, and they were running not only from the scandal in the South, but from creditors. It was hard times for members of The Vine, and this caused a lot of people to leave. We need to talk a little bit about what this group believes in, in order for you to get a feel for the atmosphere at the time. The Vine members are Christian fundamentalists to the extreme. They will not align themselves with any other church because, <laughs> where have I heard this before as an ex-Mormon? <laughs> None of the other churches are true. They are the only true church. The Vine believes that the other churches do not have the restored priesthood and gospel of Jesus Christ, and that means that the other churches are fallen. And so the members of the Vine belong to the one and only true church in their minds. That is literally the exact same thing that the Mormons believe. Gene Spriggs, the founder of the group, is known in the church as Yannick, which is Hebrew and it means the anointed one. He preaches that in order for Jesus to return to the earth, the church must be restored to its original form with the same structure as when Jesus was on earth. Again, this is all very familiar to me. And the church, um, the vine relies heavily on the Bible, especially the book of Acts. Spriggs teaches, as the leader of this church, that when the church is restructured across the earth, it will consist of 12 tribes, which will be located in 12 different geographic regions of the earth, and that once those 12 tribes are established in those sacred locations, it will be time for the apocalypse and then for Jesus' return to earth. Jesus's? Jesus? <laughs> It's important to note that this religion uses the name Yahshua instead of Jesus. They believe that that word Yahshua represents the true name of Jesus, his true nature. I'm not sure I'm saying that right. It could be Yahshua. I don't know, but it's spelled Y-A-H-S-H-U-A. <laughs> In fact, all of the members of this cult take on Hebrew names for the same reason. They choose the names to reflect the personality of each individual. Damn, I better stay far away from this cult. They'll be naming me like Salty Loudmouth or like Old Lady Monster or something. <laughs> What's Hebrew for Salty Loudmouth? <laughs> The cult also believes in three eternal destinies, which is a theory that states after the fall of man, Adam and Eve's story, which causes us all to die at some point, we enter a state of being called death, regardless of our faith. In Mormonism, it's called purgatory. We all go to a spiritual prison to await the second coming of Jesus, and then we will be judged and placed in our forever categories after the second coming. That's what Mormons believe. It's very similar to this. This cult also has some very disturbing beliefs about race. And if you're easily upset by things like this, I would stop watching now. For one, it teaches that slavery was, and this is a quote, a marvelous opportunity for black people who are deemed by the Bible to be servants of white people. Oh my God. That tells you how daft and how evil this cult is. And they also teach that homosexuals deserve, again, this is a quote, no less than death. So pretty much these guys and their stupid beliefs, they try and hide these bigoted attitudes and their hate in order to recruit new members. But this is most definitely what they believe in, what they still believe in. I think the lowest form of human intelligence is racism. And I think the lowest form of human intelligence is bigotry against people that are born differently than you in any way, be it queer, be it of a different race, a different nationality. That is like Neanderthal thinking, caveman thinking, my land, your land, me good, you bad. Like it's the stupidest thing in the world to me. I think people that think that way are not smart, and I will die on that hill. I, th I think you're dumb. I said what I said. So now the cult has moved to Vermont, but that's not good enough for the Citizens Freedom Foundation, who follows them there and begins to hold meetings to alert the citizens of Barton, Vermont, that the cult has arrived in their town. This foundation is not letting up, and soon members are able to convince the local police that the cult is dangerous. People from the Citizens Freedom Foundation get documentation showing cops in Barton, Vermont, proof that there have been accusations of kidnapping and even abuse inside this cult. In 1983, police charged one of the elders in the group, a man named Charles Eddie Wiseman, with child abuse. 
the basis for the charges were kids living in the cult and that the kids were not being properly educated and were not allowed to have contact with their extended family. And if that was what was going on, that is child abuse. On June 22, 1984, a massive raid took place and the Vermont State Police seized 112 children from the compound that the cult lived on. That's a lot of kids. 40 of those cases ended up being dismissed because some of the parents in the cult refused to give the children's names to authorities so they couldn't even make a formal charge. So let me clarify that. Some of those parents, this is so disgusting to me, actually let their kids go into foster care because they wouldn't give up their names. That is brainwashing. That is crazy. Some of the kids ended up being returned to the cult and some went to live with family members outside of the cult. But this event seemed to change things for the members and they wanted to avoid it happening again. The case against the elder, Eddie Wiseman, then falls apart because the accuser, the one alleging the child abuse, recanted, saying she had been kidnapped by a deprogrammer and was made to make the accusations. Very, very muddy stuff here, right? I mean, if this guy didn't do anything, that's very, very horrible. If he did and she recanted when she got back in the cult, that's bad too. Cults are just bad all the way around. The attorney that represented Eddie Wiseman in court, she was a woman, ends up joining the cult and marrying Eddie Wiseman. <laughs> so that tells you a little something about their ability to manipulate and brainwash people. These cults grow for a reason. There are some very charismatic people involved and they have charm and wit and they can be very attractive to some. I mean, there are people in this country right now that if some cute little old hippie man showed up and said, come and live on a beautiful farm and we'll share all of our food with you and you don't have to drive two hours a day to work and you don't have to sit at a desk for eight hours a day. There are people that are like, that sounds pretty damn good because of the hellscape that we live in right now. So it, it's easy to see when things are not going well in people's lives, how they can be pulled away by these groups. I don't automatically assume that everyone that joins a cult is not smart. I, I think they get not smart when they start believing crazy things about race and queer people. I think that's really stupid, but I don't think they start out that way all the time. And is that judgment? you damn straight. I judge bigots, 100%. Always have, always will. By 1989, the church had really grown. I couldn't find an exact date for the official name change from the Vine to the 12 tribes, but by the early 1990s, the church was known as the 12 tribes community. It still is. They have a website. You can go check it out. At that point in time, they had expanded into Canada, Germany, Argentina, England, Brazil, Australia, and it appears it was during this expansion that the name change took place. I just couldn't find an exact date. By the turn of the century, 2000, the group was, again, in legal trouble, facing charges of child labor law violations and more child custody interference. It was very common for one member of a family, one parent, to join the cult and take the children with them. The other parent was left trying to get the child out of the cult and get custody back, and this caused a lot of legal troubles for the cult. Can you think of anything worse than that? Like your partner has run off and joined a group of Cocoa Puffs and taken your child and now you're left fighting to try to get your child away from these crazies. Like, I don't know, that's just like a nightmare to me. By 2006, elders felt it was time to go home, back to Tennessee. The 12 tribes put out the word there would be a reunion for everyone who had ever participated in the Vine Christian Community Church. And that reunion would be held in Warner Park, Chattanooga, where it all began. So this reunion takes place, and then after the reunion, many of the longtime members of the church stayed. They had big plans, and in 2008, the Yellow Deli was reopened. It is still open, and this is what it looks like now. Apparently, the sandwiches are really good. I'm personally not going to buy a hate sandwich that helps to support a cult, but apparently they're really good. <laughs> The restaurant closes each month in September for Yom Kippur, but it is still there, only now without its founder and prophet, Yahshua, Gene Spriggs, who died in January of 2021. Now, why do we care? Why do we talk about cults here and why does it matter to us? This is just some little group of hippies with some strange beliefs that make great sandwiches and don't bother anyone, right? No. And that is why we talk about cults and about people like this, because they are dangerous and because they hurt people. And even when, as it often is in cults, it's difficult to prove the crimes that are committed against members, 
We talk about them because it's difficult to prove those crimes. The worst things go on under the cover of family or religion, and we have to stay vigilant in order to keep these kinds of groups from running unchecked. Let's talk about Sinasta Colucci. Sinasta was born in Detroit in 1984. His father was a black man with Cherokee ancestry, and his mother is a white woman. They split when Sinasta was a baby, and his mother took him and moved to Redding, California, where there are really not a lot of black people and very few Native Americans. Sinasta reports growing up terrified of getting into trouble with the cops. He says he was called every foul and disgusting racist name while growing up, and he reports that he never felt he fit in anywhere. He was too black for the white people, not black enough for the black people, and he had a very difficult time with his identity. This is what he reports. Then Sinasta discovered the 12 tribes while living in Missouri. This is the thing. He's a vulnerable, hurt person. He's broken and he's damaged and he's looking for a place to fit in. And this is why I hate cults because they take people like Sinasta that really need a loving home and they exploit them. In the beginning, he thought it was heaven. The people were not separated by race. They lived in a community equally in the beginning. Then Sinasta began to learn about their beliefs on race, and he was shocked to hear the group's blatant white supremacist ideals because there were black people in the cult. There were also people that Sinasta assumed were gay in the cult, and the elders preached homosexuals must be put to death. The longer he stayed, he realized that these people had been so severely brainwashed that they had fallen in line with these horrible teachings, believing they were less than, believing they were inferior because of who they are, and that the only way they could be saved was to work for the cult and to devote their lives to the cult. That's why this matters, my friends. That's why we talk about these things. People that are broken and in pain are susceptible to abuse, and it's important that we look out for them. You can disagree with me on whether or not we are our brother's keeper. That is your opinion but you will never change my mind. I am my brother's keeper. That's how I see it, and nothing will ever change that. You guys love to call me libtard and left wing, which I'm not, by the way. I just call it do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I know I am a godless agnostic heathen, but I swear sometimes it almost seems like I'm living like Jesus wanted people to. <laughs> Shh, don't tell the devil worshipers, of which I am apparently a part. <laughs> The devil. Oh, what would we do without the good old devil? <laughs> hey, you guys said you like it when I'm more myself. This is me. I'm instantly regretting some of the things I just said. <laughs> Shit, I don't care anymore. I don't care. If I'm going to spend 60 hours a week doing this, I'm going to say what I want. Sinasta began to notice the extreme control the cult had over its members. Once he saw a child severely whipped with the long plastic rods used to hold helium balloons, and he saw children being hit in the mouth if they spoke too loudly. The men were given a masturbation schedule. <laughs> yes, you heard that right. And the cult members were even taught a very specific way to use toilet paper. I'm not even going to go into what Sinasta said because it is just foul. But they were given like one square. Nasty and just weird, and that shows you the level of control they wanted over people. Children in the cult are viewed as property and subject to brutal physical punishment if they disobey. Sinasta learned that the group saw him as part of what they call the Curse of Ham, which is described in Genesis. This is basically a very racist teaching as to why some people have more melanin in their skin than others. It's freaking asinine. I love it when people quote the Bible at me, and I'm like, you know, I'm not going to take my theories on life from people that lived in a time where they thought the moon was made out of cheese and sacrificing goats made it rain. I, I, I think we can do better than that. Are there some good teachings in the Bible? Of course there are, but I'm not going to pattern my life after people that lived 2,000 years ago and didn't even know what a germ was, didn't even know how the human body worked. I, I'm just, I'm not. And just for your information, other groups that teach the curse of Ham, the KKK, the Westboro Baptist Church, you know, that's pretty much all you need to know. The 12 tribes also teaches that Martin Luther King was filled with evil spirits guiding him. Their words about Martin Luther King are, all manner of evil filled that man. It is horrible that someone would rise up to abolish slavery. What a marvelous opportunity that blacks could be brought over here to be slaves so that they could be found worthy of the nations. It just, 
makes me, like I said, it's the lowest form of human intelligence. It really is just such a crock of shit. Oh, and they say all of these things while insisting that their teachings are not racist. They're just following the Bible. One of the elders in the church is a black man named Johanan Abraham, and he's written several articles saying the racist teachings are taken out of context and all the other bullshit that these people always claim. But that's not the case. They're, they're racist. Let's talk a little bit about another member, Carolyn Figueroa, who spent about a year in the 12 tribes. She said as soon as she was baptized and began to hear the sermons, she knew she had made a terrible mistake. They finally let you in to what their real teachings are after you're baptized. One day, a man of mixed race was giving a lesson and said something to the effect that black people are cursed and their only hope of righteousness was to submit to the white man. Carolyn said she said out loud, are you kidding me? And then that night, a bunch of people came to her house and kind of tried to talk her out of it, talk her out of being mad, and they succeeded. She stayed with the group for a little while longer, but she eventually did leave, and she has been very vocal about the things she has seen in the cult. Children are apparently treated horribly in this cult. I'm having a really hard time with the child thing lately. I, I just, I'm so disgusted at how many people believe it is okay to hit a child. And they say that, spare the rod, spoil the child. Again, I'm not taking my cues on child psychology from a 2000 year old book. I, 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 I can't believe how many people think it's okay to hit kids. You go to jail for hitting an adult. You think you should be able to hit a defenseless child. It is appalling to me. People are like, kids need respect. Do you respect people that hit you? It is literally the most backwards ass thinking that I have ever come across in my life. Anyways, yes, this is a thing with me lately and it keeps coming up and I keep bringing it up and I'm not really sure what I'm gonna do with it at this point in time, but you guys know me well enough to know I sure as hell ain't gonna shut up about it. The kids in this cult, I just feel so sorry for them. Some time ago, the cult moved to Boulder, Colorado. Now, what did I tell you? Remember in the episode about Bentino Massaro, the sex guru that claims he's part alien and part God? I talked a little bit about how Boulder, Colorado has become this mecca for all things conspiracy theorist, all things anti-vax, all things new age spiritualism. Well, that's a big reason that the 12 tribes settled there. I don't think they've been there very long, probably less than five years, but they've already caused trouble. I read an article written by a reporter named Nicole Dorfman, who was invited to spend some time on the 12 tribes commune. These are some of the photos that were taken then. As you can see, it's very isolated and very much feels like a commune. She says she saw an eerily perfect garden, smiling faces, everything was just a little bit too perfect too eerie and she said the vibe was strange they offered her some kind of tea they kept offering it and she just kept refusing i think she was worried she was going to be drugged have you guys seen midsommar the horror movie one of my favorite cult movies very very good those kind of vibes the people were chanting and clapping and then there was this long prayer before dinner and she noticed during dinner the children were frequently leaving the table to go to the bathroom more than they should have been and she wondered like something in the tea maybe and every time they got up to go to the bathroom an adult went with them which really creeped her out and that creeps me out too kids need privacy they don't need an adult with them in the bathroom when they're 10 years old that is just creepy and weird which brings me to the last thing we're going to talk about today and the most important reason we have to talk about groups like this the children if people want to join some messed up cult and believe whatever crazy thing they want to believe they have that right so long as they do not hurt anyone else that is the caveat but they are hurting someone else when they bring an innocent child into a cult. The kids are always the ones that end up hurt, the worst in the cults, and this one is no exception. Former 12 tribes children are now adults. They grew up in the cult in the 1980s and 1990s, and they describe enduring extreme physical abuse as children. The cult had a practice called scourging, where a child would be stripped naked and beaten with a rod from head to toe. Others describe food being withheld from children as a form of discipline for days at a time. If the children snuck food when they were hungry, they were locked in the basement for days. That is true child abuse. People argue spanking is not child abuse. You could make an argument for that. I still think that hitting has one definition. There's one definition to the word hitting. It doesn't matter where you hit, you're still hitting. 
The kids are taught to hate the government, that the social workers who came with food and candy bars to try to talk to them were actually not there because they're concerned or checking on the kids, like they say, but because they had been sent by the devil to corrupt the children and take them away from the church into the evil secular world. One former childhood member reports that it wasn't just your parents or the elders who were given the authority to abuse the kids. Any member of the cult could punish any child. The children were seen and are seen as communal property. One of the women who doesn't want to be named says that one time she was beaten for wearing her ponytail too high and for looking around while she walked. The children are instructed to look at their feet at all times. So yeah, this is super healthy. Just a great environment to raise children in. There are logs of police calls, many calls, that have come into the Boulder and Manitou Springs Police Departments made by concerned residents who have had some kind of contact with the cults. In 2020, a caller went to the commune to visit a young relative and found out that her nephew was being kept in a basement without any electricity, heat, or a bathroom. That same year, a 16-year-old girl ran away from the Manitou Springs compound in the middle of the night. She was hungry, she was malnourished, and she told stories of being locked in basements and closets and beaten with rods. Then in January of 2022, the police received information from an informant that said additional and sinister things were happening at the compound. 50-year-old Ron Williams was found to have over a thousand images of child S.A. in his possession, and he was arrested. Protective custody? Okay. What do you need protective custody for? I have one. You do? I do. Okay. So what do you need to be protected from? Other inmates. Okay. Yeah, I was going to turn myself in. Okay, well, All you right. passed the police station. I know, a couple times. Okay. All right, well, we're going to bring you down to the police station right now, okay? Then we'll go from there. All right. All right. So what's going to happen from here, okay? Right now you're in custody. Okay. I'm going to take you down to my station. We're going to do some processing, getting you ready to take down to county jail, okay? Um, i got to make some phone calls while we're there, um, which might take might make take it a little bit longer. I'll give them a call. All right. Because um, it sounds like Boulder County is looking for you as well. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not going to ask you anything about that. That's their case, and I don't want to mess anything up, all right? Sorry. All right. Oh, I'm all out of property bags. It's okay. We're going to the PD anyways. Okay. Do you need anything? No. Yay! So, possible suspect for the boulder fire. That's fine. Okay, buddy. Mm. All right. If I can, have you have a seat in here for me. Do you have anything else on you that I need to know about? Um, so you have, uh, some ibuprofen. Some okay, you can just toss it all on your jacket. Okay. Um, do you mind uh, just turn your pockets inside out for me just so I can take a look? Yeah. All right, cool. All right, have a seat. I'm gonna get that. Like I said, I'm gonna get that processing done, um, and make sure we, we don't need to wait here for anybody else. And then uh, most likely we'll be on our way down to CJC. Okay? okay. Have you been to CJC before? I'm all that is. It's the El Paso County Jail. No. No. Not long before this, someone had burned down a home in Marshall, and the act of arson has been tied to the cult. There's still kind of an investigation going on on that, and I will definitely follow up. There have also been allegations of bestiality. Because all sexual contact between unmarried people is strictly forbidden, the young men raised in the 12 tribes often find other outlets for their sexual desires. When they are caught doing this, they are forced to kill the animal. Oh, this is so gross. This is so, you know, it's all cheeky and weird and interesting to talk about until you really get down to the nitty gritty and then it's just flat out disturbing. If young men and women are caught holding hands or kissing, they are forced to marry each other. That's the punishment, marriage. <laughs> if anyone is caught engaging in homosexual acts, according to the leaders, they must be put to death. Has that happened? It has not been proven to have happened, but there are those that have serious concerns about certain members of the cult that have gone missing.
Abuse inside the 12 tribes is rampant. The members are abused physically and they are abused psychologically. They are beaten and starved. They are brainwashed and they are controlled. And it is going on right this moment as we speak about it. The members are not allowed to drink coffee. They are not allowed to drive on Saturdays. They are not allowed to eat chocolate. And for some reason, Irish music is forbidden. The women must part their hair down the middle and they also have to roll up their pants for some reason. On the weekends, they can only wear dresses, no pants. And the worst part, if there is a worst part, it seems that Marcia, Jean's wife, who's still alive, is very much Aunt Lydia from The Handmaid's Tale. She is the most oppressive when it comes to the women. There are even stories of men going to Jean, telling him about abuse the women are suffering. And when Marcia finds out that someone's sticking up for the women, she has the men reported and they're beaten or abused in some way. So Marcia sounds like is the worst. We all get so focused and tied up in our own lives that it's very easy to forget Dark and sinister things are happening around us at all times. I wish I had some better news or a better outcome to report, but I just don't. The 12 Tribes cult is still fully functioning. They travel around to preach and evangelize and they recruit new members. They apparently just purchased a refurbished GMC PD4501, which is a Greyhound bus model made in the 1950s. They use this bus to travel from town to town. The FBI continues to release reports documenting allegations of child abuse and abuse of adults as well. A raid was recently conducted on the Australia compound after a hundred or so calls came in from concerned citizens worried about the children on that compound. We have religious freedom in this country. It's something we value and we protect. I will fight for your right to believe whatever you want to believe. But my question is, when are we going to fight and protect the children being hurt by the adults whose rights we protect so fiercely? Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday, and for my rant. I am a very passionate and outspoken person, and I know it can come off as virtue signaling, but if you've known me my whole life, like some of you have, it's not. I really care about kids. I taught dance for 20 years. I love kids, and these kinds of stories make me very angry. So forgive me when I go on my rants. Um, until the next one. I'm too old to change, you guys, I'm too old. Please hit the like button if you like the video, subscribe to the channel if you wanna see more, and you can also join my Patreon. We have a big goal, we are hitting it after the first of the year, and it's this. We would like to raise money to donate to police departments that have cold case DNA in storage that has never been tested because there's no money to test it. There are thousands of sexual assault kits sitting in refrigeration, and we would like to raise the money pick a case and get that kit tested. The kits cost between five and $750 each. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could solve a crime? And the other thing that happens, the byproduct of getting that kit tested is that perpetrator's DNA goes in the system forever. And if they've committed other crimes, other departments might get a hit. We're really gonna hit this hard after the first of the year and by joining my Patreon, you help support this cause. I realize how many other options you guys have to watch true crime, to watch dark stories, and I am so appreciative that you watch mine. I truly am. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other, and I will see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.